So, I wanted to begin with the story of my friend Will and I'm not telling you the story for just for fun but because it illustrates a fundamental quality of the universe ish he's not here today that's why I can tell the story he's been here most weeks and he and I both work in the universe same university and we get the bus up to the university the free university bus and the bus leaves from three places in Bangkok Wat Mahathat, which is no good for either of us Wat Si Sudaram, we call Wat Si and Macro now he and I both approach from the same direction and to go to Wat Si is about a nine minute walk I know this because I went to university there and I have every single route timed out to perfection which is why I'm always late <laughs> But if you go to macro, it's a two minute walk. And I kept saying to him, go to macro. And he said, no, 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 I, I was told to get the bus from Watsi. I'm like, you can get the bus from Watsi, but macro is closer. No, 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 every, I, they said that Watsi is the place to get the bus. I said, yeah, but the bus at Watsi is very unreliable. You never quite know what time it's leaving. He said, oh, I know, but I, that's what I get there half an hour early. And I said, but macro is much better. And he said, no, I, you know, people, everyone sold me to go to Watsi. You just can't talk to people like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and what it is, is he gets very stuck in his ways. If he has a little system and something that's working, he doesn't want anything to endanger that system. He also has a particular seat on the bus and he has to get that seat. And he got the bus one time, he was there half an hour early and somebody was sitting in his seat Every other seat on the bus is free but that seat somebody was sitting in So you know what he did? He got there 45 minutes early the next week because he has to have that seat, that's his spot So then one day, as he has to take a bus to get to where, the, where we get the buses to the university and then one day the bus didn't stop at the bus stop and he overshot so he's in a bit of a panic and he's walking back along the road and he sees the bus at Macro that I've been telling him about so he looks and he sees it has Mahatula written on the bus and he says well yeah he's torn now does he do what he, he knows works or does he venture outside of his comfort zone and walk across the car park at Macro and take the bus so he does, he, he walks across and he gets the bus at Macro and he sends me a message oh the Macro bus is much closer than the other one <laughs> this is after like about three years right after about three years so what's the principle of the universe that this story is exemplifying this was brought to my attention by Robert Persig who some of you may know the name he wrote a very famous book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance many people read that book? a few people? could anybody understand that book? yeah, a few less <laughs> it's one of the classics and it's worth reading um, but not so many people know that 20 years later he wrote a follow-up book and that book was called Leela L-I-L-A and Leela was much better than the original I think you need to read the original first but Leela was much more down to in the first book basically he either went enlightened or mad one or the other and probably more mad than enlightened I think or some kind of satori which is a flash of enlightenment but not full enlightenment then 20 years later he had brought this 
insight that he'd had down to earth and he wrote this Lilo was a much more down to earth book still way way out there but he's trying to understand the universe that's his quest and in the first book he's trying to understand what is quality that was his quest in the second book he decides that for most philosophy we separate the universe into self and non-self or subject and object and in this book Lila he says that's fine but there's a different way to understand or to a filter through which to understand the universe and that is as dynamic and static and when he looked around at the world around him he could divide everything up into dynamic and static static means the laws or the regulation the way things work in a system the way the system works and dynamic is that thing that bucks the system and creates something special if things are too systematized there's no magic if things are too dynamic there's no magic so in order for the truly good things to happen and the truly good ways to understand things you need this careful balance between the static and the dynamic so my friend Will is overly biased towards the static if he has a system that works he doesn't want anything to interfere with that system so he's leaning towards the static and the system that he has works fine he's happy with it that's the important thing it's just me that was unhappy with it <laughs> I don't know why I so desperately wanted him to take the bus that was closer I, like didn't fit my universe you know he's breaking the universe so when finally you get him into that situation that he's willing to break that static rule and go into the dynamic take a risk then he can make changes and make improvements but of course what happens next is he will always take the macro bus and never go to the Watsiso Duran bus so there's the static and dynamic but the dynamic once it works once it produces a good result it has to be made static so you have this movement from the dynamic to the static I read this book 25-30 years ago and ever since then I've seen this principle in action everywhere that I look in all kinds of different things if you look out in nature I, I am quite interested in plasma cosmology I recognize that most people wouldn't even know or care what plasma, plasma cosmology is but it's very dear to my heart so and in plasma cosmology plasmas are ionized gases usually very hot basically like the Sun and when you get to the Sun there's not much really going on there you can't have life you can't there's not much complexity coming out of the Sun it's too much dynamic the gases are bouncing around like crazy the electrostatic forces are zipping around and making these Birkeland currents and coils and any hot gas really is just too chaotic for organization on the other hand you have a rock and a rock doesn't change much if you really chill it down a lot it will contract a bit if you really heat it up a lot it will expand a little bit but basically rocks are rocks and they don't do very much so you have the static and you have the dynamic for life to happen 
it needs to be in this mid-range, this borderland between the static and dynamic. That's where life happens. And when you look at the constituency of the world, the primary constituency of the earth is rock, iron, uh, aluminium or aluminum if you in America. And the primary constituent, there's, there's six main substances that make up the earth. Of the atmosphere you have oxygen and nitrogen. Between the earth and the atmosphere you have this very thin wispy layer of carbon and it's carbon where life happens. So all of you are made out of carbon and water. A couple of other vague ingredients, but basically you're carbon and water. And so that's where life happens. That's where you have this necessary balance between the dynamic and the static. Evolution works in the same way. Species get into a static kind of what works and they can live for millions of years. Crocodiles have basically not changed since the dinosaurs time. Basically the same. Tortoises and turtles basically haven't changed for, you know, way back before the dinosaurs. It kind of works and they're happy with it. <laughs> but for evolution to work you need this dynamic change. You need to introduce random changes into the structure of the DNA. And every so often one of those structures will produce the magic. That then has to get translated back down to the static. So we have this principle uh, in operation once again. I was looking at mosquitoes and some experiments done with mosquitoes. And the experiment was if you give some mosquitoes an orange, because male mosquitoes eat fruit, right? It's the females that bite humans. Did you know that? <laughs> Is that significant? I'm not sure. The males eat fruit. So if you have an orange, that's enough food for thousands of generations of mosquitoes. An orange will feed 10,000 mosquitoes for seven days. Mosquitoes live about seven days. So if a mosquito finds an orange, in theory, there's absolutely no reason for the mosquito to go anywhere else. It can live out its full seven days, a ready-made food source. Is there any reason to go anywhere else? Well, maybe to find a female mosquito. But, um, <laughs> but what happens with the mosquitoes is they will eat a few times and then you have what's sometimes called the maverick gene that propels the mosquito to suddenly, for no reason at all, go flying off in another direction. And again you have this thing, the static and the dynamic. This maverick gene will propel a certain number of the species into extreme or irregular forms of action. And it's this that then allows the mosquito as a species to spread because that mosquito, that maverick, will go and find a different piece of fruit or a sewer or a human being. Usually they like Arthur, the, Arthur, the mosquitoes, they like certain people. So if you're anywhere where there's mosquitoes, go and sit next to Arthur. And they, they kind of, it's true, right? They do. It is true. They really like him. So we see this exact same principle happening uh, with Buddhism. And actually, when you get the eye for this static dynamic system, when you get the eye for it, it, it happens everywhere. So with the meditation, with, the, with Buddhism, you start off with the Buddha. Tremendously charismatic character, able to influence, able to teach, able to touch people's hearts in a way that most of his arahants, his enlightened people, don't. And often we like to think of somebody great, a great monk. We think, well, he's, he's like 90% enlightened, right? Well, we like to think that if someone's enlightened, they'll be tremendously beautiful and 
you know, impressive. That's not the case at all. Most of the Buddha's enlightened disciples just fizzled out. We never heard anything more about them. They just vanish. And there's other enlightened people who are really not beautiful. For example, he's dead now, I can say this. Um, Nisargadatta Maharaj, have you read that? I am that. Some of you, you've read I am that. You didn't read that? I am that is a book by Nisargadatta. I'll send it to you. This is an all-time classic book. It's like listening to God. I mean, it's just fantastic. So, Nisargadatta, most of us kind of accept as an enlightened being. He was finished, he was enlightened. But when you listen to the way he talked, he was a really irritable, grumpy, cantankerous old git. That's the only way to describe it. And I mentioned this to uh, a man who's also, you see his YouTubes on, on the internet. He's a man, he, he made it his life's goal to go around and find enlightened people and interview them and test by his interview whether they're really enlightened or not. And I said to him, you know, Nisargadatta, he seemed like such a contemporary old git. And he started laughing and he said, you know, I lived with Nisargadatta for years and that's exactly what he was like. <laughs> so he said to me, he said, yeah, Nisargadatta used to stay up in his room and when he wanted something, he'd get his walking stick and bang his walking stick on the floor like this, I want something. And then his disciples would go running up and saying, what do you want? And he says, I want my glass of water here. <laughs> this kind of thing. So. The idea that enlightened people are beautiful is incorrect. Beautiful people are beautiful people, and they may or may not be enlightened. Charismatic people that touch people's hearts, they don't need to be enlightened, they're a great person. If you get these two together, then you get a Buddha, one who has great charisma, uh, great beauty and perfection, and is enlightened, then you get a really special Buddha. But then after he gives this teaching, that teaching necessarily gets formulated, formalized, formalized, form, form, gets put into formulas. What's the word? Formularic. Formularic. So the teachers get formularic. Formu yeah. Put in the system, get systematized. <coughs> right. Very good. So we see this same principle again. When the Buddha was giving his teachings, it was a very, very much a dynamic teaching. It was quite stark against the other teachings that were around at the time. For example, uh, even at that time in India, there was quite a strong delineation of the caste system. The Buddha said, when you come and ordain as monks with me, there is no more caste. It is like a river. You may be a great river, you may be a medium river, or you may be a small river, but when you enter the ocean, there's no more rivers. He said in the same way, whatever caste you come from, when you enter into my Sangha, you are all my, our Sangha, the monks. So some of his cousins ordained, five of his cousins, who were the noblemen of the family, and when they ordained, they wanted to take their servant with them, right? <laughs> and so when they ordained, they made their servant ordain first, because in the Buddhist Sangha, whoever ordains first is more senior. So they had their servant, actually he was their barber, their hairdresser. So they had him ordain above them, so that he would be senior to them. This is quite stark compared to the form in India at the time. So the Buddha introduced a lot of these kind of revolutions. He ordained women. At that time, it was not considered seemly or right for women to leave the town and go and live in the forest. This was deemed the realm of men for good reasons. The forest was a dangerous place. Even the monks were told if you go into unsafe areas, you must go in groups of four. So 
He introduced a lot of these revolutions, but those revolutions then, that dynamic change, that ability to see through this form that you live in and find what should be done or what is right or what is special, then has to get systematized and becomes the religion. So often when people come to Buddhism especially, they get mixed up between these two systems and they only want the dynamic, special, free-thinking, Zen master kind of iconoclastic kinds of teaching. But actually most of Buddhism is necessarily maintained through the static forms. A good example of a static form is the robes. We should probably update this system. It's not terri well you don't know, but it's not terribly convenient to wear robes. And maybe we should introduce a new uniform. I think that you know they did in in Vietnam and in uh, China and Japan, according to what was practical. So the form that we have of Buddhism is necessarily a formalized or systematized form of this dynamic teaching. But whenever something gets, remember, too dynamic, it gets too wacky. When it gets too formulaic, it stops working. So necessarily within Buddhism, you have this, it's almost like a lung, this beating heart, where somebody comes along and reinvigorates the tradition of Buddhism. And after they reinvigorate it, it settles down and becomes a formula. And then once the formula becomes too static, you need someone else to come along and re-inject that vigor. So for example, when Buddhism got to China, they, the Chinese took all the schools that they could find, primarily five different schools that they took from India to China, but also teachings from the other schools. And many of these schools were Buddhism, as I talked about last week, were very different from each other. And they put all of these schools into a system, it's called the Tiantai system, kind of eight levels of Buddhism, or three turnings of the wheel of Buddhism. And they formalized this, all of these different teachings and put them into layers. And, and it was a tremendous work of organization. But once you put everything into a static system, what goes wrong? You lose that dynamic aspect to it. So then the sixth patriarch then re-injected the dynamic aspect. And he said, all of this study and form that you do is wrong. What you need to do is get back to the original mind. Everything else is teachings, get back to the original mind. So he said, all of you doing, studying these teachings and practicing these teachings, you're wrong. What you have to do is get back to this original mind. So you see, again, he's really stirring things up. Things become formalized because the formulas work. So to throw out all the formula side and only take the dynamic side isn't right either. But you need somebody to do this. So then what happens? So the only meditation, the only thing that you need to do is point your attention back to your original mind. Everything else is stuff that arises and ceases. So what happens to that teaching? Well, what is the original mind? How do we talk about the original mind? What are the qualities of the original mind? Does my teacher have original mind and that teacher doesn't have original mind? Does a dog have original mind? And then takes the dynamic teaching and puts it into a system. So later on when Zen kind of got to Japan. What original mind had become too formalized. And they said, what you need to do is know the one mind. There's only one mind. Oh, so it's not the original mind compared to the non-original mind. There's only one mind. Okay, again, an injection of dynamic thing. But then again, they systematize the teachings of the one mind 
So then a later Zen master said, there is no mind. All you one-minders are wrong, we're the no-minders. So it gets confusing, but when you understand it in this system of a dynamic and static, and the dynamic, you always have people out on the fringes, and most of them are nutcases, but every so often one is going to introduce something that is good and is useful. Just like evolution will introduce all kinds of various variations into the genome, right? Evolution introduced this thing of sickle cells, you may have heard of. And sickle cells as your red blood cells are shaped like a, instead of being round, they're shaped like a half moon shape. And this will lower your lifespan considerably and cause you diseases. But, <clears throat> malaria can't get into sickle cell blood cells. So in an area where there's malaria, the sickle cell will work. And that's why you have this sickle cell anemia of people. Uh, it was an adaptation that worked to prevent malaria. Uh, so, you always have this system of something dynamic and something static. When we come to meditation, we're doing the same thing. Because there is one aspect of your mind that is very dynamic. We would call the consciousness. But most people don't live in the consciousness, we live in the subconscious. And you see this when you do meditation, because you say, okay, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Okay, I've got the system now, breathe in, breathe out. Now I can go off and think about dinner, while I can leave my subconscious thinking about the breath. Is the natural system. You're putting in an effort and an energy into meditation. Right? Watch the breath, be awake, be aware. And very quickly this gets put into a system, in, out, in, out, parcel it off to the subconscious. Now you go off thinking about dinner, right? or the person behind you or something. So you have to keep reigniting that dynamic aspect of the mind. So a lot of the meditation focuses on sharpening and brightening this dynamic aspect of the mind. And in fact, if you look around at society, you can see that most people operate like little machines. They follow the society, they follow the way of thinking that they've got from their parents, or their teachers. And their way of thinking, like my friend Will taking the bus, it works, it gets him to university. And most people, until your way of thinking is seriously endangered, you're quite happy with it, you're not willing to step outside of those boundaries. And this is where most people operate. You get up, you get, have your breakfast, you go to work, you come home, you turn on the TV, turn on the computer, you do your emails, you go to bed eight hours a day, get up, you feed the cat. Same kind of system, over and over. And to introduce a dynamic aspect of stop, find consciousness, find where the mind is, that takes an effort and an energy. And if any of you are psychologists, you know that when we study uh, animals, we want to know what makes a human being different to animals, especially monkeys, because we like monkeys. What makes human beings so different? And part of the thing is that animals just get into a system of what works. Even if it doesn't work very well, they're happy with it. And the only time that an animal will really learn something is when you can stimulate that sharpness and consciousness. So, I was showing my students in the... I teach psychology in the university, how to stop a dog crossing an invisible line. So you, you make a visible or invisible line, usually you start with a piece of string, and you walk backwards and forwards over the string. If the dog crosses the string, you stop, you grab hold of the dog and you move it back. Once it's moved back on the right side of the line, you give it a reward, and so on and so forth until eventually you can cross that line, but the dog won't cross the line. It only gets rewards if it's on that side of the line. 
And so within a couple of days, you can train your dog not to cross the line. And the reason that they were doing this is in America, in many states and places, if your dog runs free outside, you get fined. Your dog has to be on a leash. So they want to train their dogs not to go through the doorway. But you notice you can only train the dog to do this, A, when it's hungry, and B, when you're giving it rewards, little treats. Because if you're hungry and a little bit of food comes up, suddenly the dynamic aspect of the mind starts firing up, right? You know, oh, maybe I can do something. And if you're fed and there's no reward, basically with animals, you can't teach them anything. So, again, you see this exact same system, but in the mind you also have this thing of the wakefulness and the consciousness that most people do not live in that dynamic part of the mind. Most people live in the unconscious, actually the subconscious, slight distinction there, but subconscious parts of the mind. That's why you can say, you know, okay, I'm going to, where's a place in Bangkok? I don't know. You're going to the Rojana Center. And you get up and say, okay, I'll go to the Rojana Center. And before you know it, you're kind of like, oh, I'm here. Because the entire way here, if you've been here before, is managed by your subconscious. But the first time you came here, it seemed to be a really much longer way. Because you're looking around and you're looking at buildings and you're looking for something. You fired up that dynamic part of your mind. We don't like to do that too much. We like to live in the subconscious. We like to have nice... We like to be like Will, who gets the bus, that he knows where it is. And, you know. So, very many of the meditation masters who reinvigorate and this happens in all traditions. In Tibetan tradition, some of the famous ones are Sangha and Vasubandhu and then uh, Nagarjuna, Padma Sambhava, and later ones, I'm not good on Tibetan Buddhism. Zen, you had the Bodhidharma and all the patriarchs. Look at Thailand today, you had some great meditation masters, Ajahn Chah, Ajahn Man, uh, Lumpur Sot, who reinvigorated, re sparked the interest in this. And people say, well, you know, Buddhism goes downhill, but Lumpur Man, he's great. Missing this whole dynamic, there's a dynamic input, but that has to be made into some kind of system in order to be able to use it. So, exact same thing is happening in the mind that most of the time you like to be in the static system. But meditation is going to spark you up into that mindfulness and awareness. And it's that quality that we're trying to develop when we do the meditation. So that we're going to move more into that meditation mode. But you're out on the fringes of the dynamic system here, right? And one of the beautiful things that the Buddha taught was that you have to manage both systems in order for, in order to attain to enlightenment. You need to be awakening, uh, and the word Buddha means awake. That sharp consciousness, awareness and mindfulness present in the present moment, not wandering around in the past and the future, not wondering what's for dinner and what's on TV and are they going to do, ever do another series of Breaking Bad, and things like this. Downton Abbey, will they ever come back? <laughs> I don't watch any of these things. I'm not telling you what I watch. Uh, but you also have to look after the unconscious or the subconscious, the, the static aspect of the mind too. So the static aspect of the mind is keeping the precepts, is being a good person. You have to get your subconscious ordered and reasonably rigorous. If your subconscious routines are not ordered and rigorous, they're going to cause you disbalance or unbalance. So the Buddha said very clearly, you, there are certain qualities of character that you need to develop. 
This is in sharp contrast to some of the Zen masters or Thai forest masters who said, you know, all that religious stuff you don't need. What you need is to see the nature of the mind itself. If your subconscious routines are not ordered and well balanced, that is not going to help you when you move into the dynamic aspect of the mind because there is no control, there is no steadiness. So the Buddha said, make merit, do meritorious deeds, practice generosity, practice wisdom, practice morality, practice patience, uh, practice uh, resolution. Uh, these kinds of uh, practices, he said, these are not enlightenment. This is not the dynamic seeing the nature of the mind. But you need to do all of these to get yourself steady. Then, when you put the mind into the dynamic aspect, into that sharp, conscious, wakefulness part of the mind, the unconscious, the subconscious, is steady. And he described this as like a wheel. And a king who goes to see, wants to make a chariot, and he goes to the wheel maker and he says, make me some wheels. And says, how long will it take? And the wheel maker says, you know, give me six weeks. He says, fine, okay, six weeks, I'll come back. And after six weeks, the king comes back to the wheel maker. Where are my wheels? And the wheel maker says, I've only done one of them, come back in another six weeks. Which just goes to show, absolutely nothing changes in any era, does it? <laughs> I remember the first adult joke that I ever understood was, a, was um, going straight, which was after porridge. These English people will know what I'm talking about. Um, and there's a guy and he got out of prison, he'd been in prison, Ronnie Barker, he'd been in prison for five years. And he gets out and he goes home and he says to his wife, where are my shoes? She said, you took them to the menders to be fixed before you went inside. He's been inside for five years. So he comes out and he goes to the shoe menders and he says, where are my shoes? And they said, they'll be ready on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first adult joke that I ever understood. I was tremendously proud of understanding that joke. So the king says, you said six weeks. I gave you six weeks. I, how long? Look, I want you to make my second wheel. Get on with it. Hurry up. How long is it going to take? And he said, he said, well, all right, you come back tomorrow. So again, nothing changes, right? So the king comes back the next day and both wheels are made. And the, both of them absolutely perfect. This was the best wheel maker in the kingdom. And the king is a little bit annoyed. He says, why do you spend six weeks or six months making the first wheel and the next wheel you can just do like that? The wheel maker said, well, these two wheels may look the same, but they're not the same. And he takes the wheel that had been made in a short period of time and he rolls it down the road. And as the wheel ran out of energy, it wobbled to the left, it wobbled to the right, and then eventually it fell over and came to a stop, as you would expect. And then he took the first wheel that had taken much longer to make, and he rolled that down the road. And as it ran out of energy, it didn't wobble to the left, it didn't wobble to the right, but eventually it stopped still, upright in the road, in the words of the Sutta, as if it was stuck to an axle. So, this, the Buddha gave this story as an analogy, as a metaphor, and said, this is what happens when the mind stops still. If you have prepared the ground when you stop the mind still, it will be rock steady. If you have not prepared the ground with the static practices, with the formulas, with the system, then when you stop the mind, the mind is going to fall over. So, 
you said that you need to practice both aspects, the static aspect. You need to be a good person, you need to be a steady person, you need to be a kind, honest, straight, wise, moral, upstanding person. That sets the ground. Then you can move into the static, into the dynamic aspect of the mind, where the meditation happens, where the magic happens. And it's only on the border between these two, a stable static system, and that dynamic pointing back to the original nature of the mind. That's where the really good meditation happens. So this is why usually when you meditate, you fall either into too much thinking because your mind just won't stop, or the mind does stop and it falls over and goes to sleep uh, or gets very murky. And it's only at that very fine balance between these two parts of the mind, when you're awake, you're aware, and you're present, the mind is not wandering off into the past or the future. You've got a stable ground and a stable character that you've built up through practice already. At that point, you're ready to penetrate through into the real uh, meditation practice. So, I wanted to put where meditation lies in with the static religious systems. And we can see that all religious systems get too static, right? The Catholic Church has done this, needs a certain amount of reinvigoration every so often. St. Francis of Assisi and all these people to reignite. Uh, but then it starts to turn into a formula, into a system. By the way, you can also look at morality as the same way, static and dynamic. You have mor you have static rules of morality um, and you have dynamic rules of morality. So people like Jesus and Buddha, they were always setting new standards for morality of what is right and wrong. But the static is also important, right? You need to follow the rules and regulations, right? You need to stop at a red light and go at a green light. You need to follow the form of the society that you're in. Right? If you go to America and someone shakes hands, you know, you should shake hands because that's the system. Right. Anyway, I'm getting off topic with that. So, uh, this is the meditation, uh, is the dynamic aspect of Buddhism. But don't fall into the mistake of thinking the dynamic aspect is the only aspect or the only real aspect. It's not. Both the dynamic and the static and the system both need to be developed together. And it's on that borderline between the two where you can really attain to the meditation. There's a great book called uh, Complexity and Chaos. It's a whole book about these borderline systems. Fabulous book, people are interested. Uh, and then secondly, between the dynamic part of the religion where you get back to the real practice and the static part of the religion. You also have the same thing in the mind, right? Whereas the, the mind likes its comfortable little routines that it will sink into. But the meditation happens when you can start to fire up that real wakefulness, that real consciousness. That's where you can learn and where you can change. Uh, did you hear that? He said, um, is there a radical shift happening now with Dharma going beyond the monkhood, going to lay people, going into new cultures? And again, you're going to see this exact same mechanism occurring. American and Europeans are taking Buddhism, but they're chopping it up into pieces, right? Purely dynamic aspect and approach. Like, well, we'll get rid of that bit. Rebirth. You know, we don't need monks. We don't need rebirth. Uh, loving kindness, we have a bit of that, and you know, generosity, well, all right, yeah, a bit of that one, and you know, so chopping it up into pieces, entering into that dynamic, everything gets called into question, and that's why you have so many nut jobs doing this in kind of new age things, right? There's a lot of crazy people out there. Um, 
going much too far with things. And there's one man, he psychoanalyzed the Buddha. He said, well, the Buddha's mother died when he was, you know, just a few days old. And it's the pain of suffering, of, of longing for this mother that he never met, that would caused him to leave his own family and go out and seek her. It's like, it's in the nut job fringe, you know, it's in the cracker. <laughs> but you have to, you know, it's when you have that dynamic aspect, that's where the magic happens, right? Also, because in Asia, you know, Buddhism get, has got very, you know, st st stagnant and very still and very formulaic, uh, and it needs that invigoration. And this is called the pizza effect. Do you know this one? Uh, in Italy, if you have no money, you get a kind of flour that doesn't rise when you bake. And good bread, the bread should, the flour should rise when you bake it, right? To make a nice loaf of bread. But if your bread, if your flour is rubbish, it doesn't rise and it comes out flat and hard. And that's bad quality. So if you have no money in Italy, you get this cheap... You get this cheap dough that doesn't rise, right? On it, you slap a bit of tomato paste and a little bit of cheese and then that's what you give your kids because you're too poor to give them a proper meal. So this then goes over to America, right? And they add anchovies and pepperoni and chicken and peppers and all these different things and onion and seafood and mussels. And then the Italians come over to see the American pizza and go, oh boy, that's like 10 times better than our pizza. But also they get interested in pizzas because they've seen someone else take it and use it and develop it. So then the pizza goes back to Italy. And now the Italians make wonderful pizzas and they say, hey, we were the pizza guys, you know, right from the beginning, not those Americans. So this pizza effect is this bouncing backwards and forwards. When you go outside of the culture into a new culture, you can put all kinds of things on your pizza. Right? You can put ice cream on your pizza, it doesn't work, that's the nut job fringe. But sometimes something's going to work and then you can bring it back. So. Yes, with Buddhism the same thing's happening. A lot of deviant lines of spirituality in America and Europe right now because people are new to it, are immature with it. But at the same time, that's the dynamic invigoration that's needed. And the interesting thing is that then bounces back to Asia and when Thais see Westerners become monks, they like, oh well there must be something <coughs> interesting in the monkhood that these Westerners are coming back and becoming monks. Sometimes people say to me, Thais, they say, you know, we're really glad that you're a monk and we really appreciate it and we know you do the practice, but the Thai monks are no good. <coughs> well, why did I ordain with Thai monks if they're no good? You know, obviously within any monastery you have that same kind of fringe. You have the people out on the fringes who are super meditators or really scoundrels, right? Those are the people out on the fringes. And within the monasteries, we don't appreciate those people so much. We don't, you know, my own temple, my own meditation master, the, the Upajaya, who gave me ordination, he's the most perfect human being I've ever met. I mean, he's, he's amazing in every way, but he's too far out there. And one day I said to him, you know, like, oh, I have a lot of lust arising, right? Because as a human being, you have lusts and desire. And, you know, in the West, we talk about this because we want to understand it and how do we deal with it and what do we do with it and how can we transform it into something useful and beneficial to the practice. And when I said this to him, he's just like, you know what he said? He said, well, don't. <laughs> and to him it's that obvious, he said, well don't do it. The Buddha is the same, he had this, um, one of the suttas, the Veda Vitaka Sutta, and he said, what if I was to split all my thoughts into good thoughts and bad thoughts? On the bad side I'd have sense desire, 
I would have harmfulness or violence. And on the good side, I would have renunciation, non-harmfulness and non-violence. And this is the definition, by the way, of right thought in the Eightfold Path of Buddhism. And he said, as soon as that occurred to me, all those wrong thoughts, I did away with them and cut them off. It's the same thing again. It's like, well, that doesn't work for us, the rest of us, right? You know, I can't just say this is a bad thought. Oh, therefore I won't have it. You know, sometimes I really want to punch someone in the face and I, I recognize it's a bad thought, but I still want to do it. <laughs> what did I do this morning? The taxi driver. I got into the taxi and I said, take me to Sugumit 23. I said, oh yeah, he said, where have you, where have you been? Do you live here? Is this where you become a monk? And I said to him, I said, I'm going to go and give a talk and I wanted to prepare myself a little bit. So if you don't mind, I'd rather not converse with you. Right? And he said, oh, where are you going to go and give a talk? I've just got into a taxi and said, go to Sugumit 23. And I've just said, I'm going to give a talk. Where do you think I'm going to go and give the talk? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really annoyed. And I know that annoyance is not good for me. It's not good for him. It's not good for the universe. It's not good for my practice. But just seeing that isn't enough. So, in the temples, <clears throat> we appreciate the people on the fringe, the good and bad, the greats and the uglies. But the people we really appreciate are the good, steady monks, the ones who do the static practice, <clears throat> the ones who go down to the chanting every day and do their practice, do their chanting day in, day out, the ones who will go and sit and do their meditation. Whether they're in bliss or whether they're in hell, they'll sit there and do their meditation day in, day out. People who are warm and consistent with people. Those are the ones in the monasteries that we really appreciate. So in my own temple, although I admired my abbot tremendously, um, there was another monk who was the head of my building. And he wasn't a meditation master. But he was, a, I wouldn't say a bigger, but he was a very strong inspiration to, to me. Because I'm not the master that my teacher is. You know, I can't just cut off lust, like, well, why have it? Finish with that. And so, you know, I appreciate that static form uh, more than the, the dynamic in that sense. Yes, you are. Yeah, what are you doing with your day then, Fletch? Me? Oh, I've had a lovely day, I have. I've been digging a garden all the morning, then I got a fish cake for me dinner. Then I went down the shoe repairers. It's all in his report there, the bionic man. <laughs> well, what did you get down the shoe shop for then, Dad? Your shoes is all right. Well, when I come out of Nick, you see, among my personal possessions was this little uh, little shoe repairer's ticket, you see. It said, Brown Brogue sold an eel. <laughs> well, that was known four years ago. Did you think they'd still be there? Well, you know, there was no harm, was there? I was passing. <laughs> what did they say? Said they'd be ready Thursday. LAUGHTER